the previous theorem told us that if we had a function on some domain, A, mapping to some image, let's say f of A, and both of these domains are in Rn and they're open subsets, and we knew that if we had, if we also had the existence of a differentiable inverse, a function that was defined in some neighborhood, so I believe we called these subsets u and v, and we knew that the restriction of f um, on u was differentiable at c, and the restriction of a function g on v was differentiable at f of c, then we had a formula for the differential of g in terms of the differential at, of f. And that was just the inverse linear transformation associated to the differential of f. But that sounds like a lot of assumptions, right? I mean, we're already assuming g is differentiable. And um, that's sort of a cop-out, and we want to have a more robust, sufficient condition for when the inverse function exists and when it's differentiable. And by studying, for instance, um, the following case, if we knew that the function was, if the function f at least was one-to-one -one and onto, onto this range, then we could ask, uh, does that necessarily imply that g is differentiable? And the following function gives an example for where that fails, even in R, even in functions of a real variable. So this example is if f of x gets mapped to x cubed, then we know that this function is differentiable, it's one to one, it's onto, but the inverse function, which also exists because of the fact that this is one to one and onto, defined by sending the element y to the cube root of y, this function, although it exists and it's continuous, it's not differentiable at zero. In fact, uh, if we even tried to calculate the derivative, we would find that it's infinity, which doesn't make sense. So what's the key assumption in our function f? Well, if we look at the function f and we try to calculate its derivative at 0, for example, we will find that derivative of f at 0 is actually the 0 linear transformation. It's 0. And it turns out that the natural generalization of this assumption is that the determinant of f should be non-zero. And why is that? Well, think about it. If we assumed that g was differentiable and we knew that the derivative, the differential of g was in terms of the inverse differential of f, for the inverse of a matrix to exist, we know that its determinant has to be non-zero. Therefore, it's a reasonable guess to think that if we require the differential of f to have a non-zero determinant at some point, then maybe the inverse function, its differential, might exist as well, and in fact it would be the inverse of that differential. But what about being one-to-one -one and onto? Maybe we should also assume those conditions to guarantee that everything works out okay. Uh, it turns out that assuming that the determinant of the differential of f is non-zero is actually enough. And from that assumption and that assumption alone, you can even prove that there exists some neighborhood u on which f is one-to-one. -one. And that's surprising. So let's state the theorem. This is called the inverse function theorem. So let A be an open subset of Rn. Let C be a point in A. 
let f be a function from a to rn. And let's say that f is actually of class c1 on a. So remember what that means. That means it's differentiable at all points, and its partial derivatives are also continuous on a. And finally, suppose that the determinant of the differential of f at the point c is non-zero. Then, with these assumptions and these assumptions alone, one can show that there exist open sets, open subsets, u and v of Rn, and a function g from v to Rn, such that the following set of conditions hold. First, we demand that c is an element of u. And let's just say it's also a subset of a. We can assume that without loss of generality. f of c is an element of v. 2, f and g are inverses of each other. We don't assume anything about g being differentiable whatsoever. Uh, and 3, g is continuous on v. And in fact, it's differentiable at f of c. And in fact, its differential is equal to what we expect. It's equal to the inverse of the differential of f at c. So it's quite amazing that this assumption here, the fact that all we assume is the determinant does not vanish at one point, implies that not only can we construct an inverse, which means in particular f is one-to-one -one on some open neighborhood around c, we can construct an inverse, and that inverse is also differentiable at that point. The proof of this theorem is not easy at all. Uh, and in fact, uh, in one video, we'll simply discuss the steps of how to approach the proof of this theorem, and we'll give a little sketch. However, each of the steps, almost all of the steps, I should say, are not that trivial.